Camille talk a lot about our legacy series, and he honestly did the intro for me. When you do think about legacy, um, usually that that is the idea and the thought about, you know, what wealth, what what uh, something of worthwhile or wealth that we're going to leave for those that we love and those who's coming up behind us. But you know, I hope that this series has been a blessing to you to challenge you to not discard that desire. Because how many of you know a, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children? So come on, keep working hard. And we want to leave for, for the generations coming up behind us. But how many of you through this series has been, have been challenged to live for something more? That man, even if you don't have the wealth in this world, you got a spiritual wealth to leave for your family. And sometimes we get caught up chasing after things in this world for good reasons. And, you know, we have ways to do it, but man, I, I'm not going to rehash everything, but man, there's a life that we are to live as followers of Jesus Christ that looks different in this world. It's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Hope City, are you giving a light out to everyone in your house? It's hard, right? Some of you thinking about unsaved loved ones or so, but you should still be a light. Are you giving out, is your life a light in your job place? Where you go every single day, are you a light? And you young people in your school, are you that light? Here's what the word says. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Man, our challenge and our assignment through this entire series has been to hopefully get us to realign our lives to fulfill scripture like this. That our lives are lived in such a way that people see the good works in our lives. They see the good works in everything that we say and how, how we do things. Not only Sunday morning, you know, but every single day, they see Christ in us so much that they know that there's a good, good father above. And, 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 and that's the challenge, even in our jobs and in our homes, when it where it could be such a challenge. But here's my heart today. If you're here for the first time or you're visiting, man, you came in the best week. I feel like this is the best message for this season. See, the legacy of all Christians, how do we stay the course? How do we stay faithful to the things that God has called us to do? A life that leaves a legacy by holding fast to the hope in God's promise especially in the midst of trial. You know, when I think about it, one of the greatest evidence against Christianity is that we live our lives in such a way that we don't believe that there's a hope. So let me, let me put it this way, and I'm guilty of this as well. Have you ever gone through your trials and you worry and you are fearful and you are anxious let me go a little bit further and touch some more sensitive spaces. You are just as bitter, hateful, angry, just as the world. Come on. Sometimes that testifies so much against who our God is. That if there is a space in our lives that we can actually see that when we go through the hardship, when we go through the disappointments in life, we look, act, sound, and operate just like the world. I want to believe that there is a call today for us to live with such a hope in Christ that leaves a legacy that, hey, one thing should be said about believers. Man, they never lost their hope. They never lost, and they never lost that joy deep down. They got hit. They cried some, some tears, you know. They felt like giving up, but they didn't give up. That they held on to the rock of all ages. 
the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who does the impossible still. It's a legacy of hope that we have. My question to you is, how many of us have truly held on to that hope? In the highs and the lows, could we truly say that if they looked at my life today, if they looked at when I was going through those trials that I'm going through right now, could they honestly say, man, that's a child of God. That's a person that does not let go of God. That no matter what, you can accuse me of anything else. But man, that person keeps running back to Christ. That person keeps running back to God. They may stumble, they may fall, but they get back up again. Come on. There's a, I know we like to celebrate the comeback story, but how many of us times we're ready to live a life where we keep that story steady? That we get, we might get shaken, but we ain't falling in the season. We might be rocked, but we're standing on the firm foundation. 1 Peter 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Woo. How many of us have that living hope today? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When we think about the gospel and even when we preach it, Christ died on the cross. Here's what we love to and you rightly should do this. We should be holding on to the fact that on the cross, Christ paid for our sin. On the cross, we are forgiven. Come on. So when we look at the cross, we should be celebrating those things. Amen? And that should bring some hope. I know I, 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 I kind of get left out there. But the truth is, a lot of us, we've forgotten how badly our sin is in the sight of God. For a lot of us, we've forgotten the cost of sin that put our Savior on that cross. And so we treat that forgiveness like it's common. We treat that forgiveness like it's common. And how do we know that? We okay living outside the world during the week, but come into the house of God and say, well, we are forgiven. But Paul warns greatly against that. That's not the main point I wanted to hit to you. But when you look at the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the scripture here, Peter tells us that by God's great mercy, you've been born again. And we know that. We know that we are forgiven. But we've been born again to a living hope. It's not just what God takes away, but what he puts inside of us. And for a long time, our belief has only been about the negative that he pulls away. And that is good, and we should celebrate that. But how many of you live in with that living hope? How many of you hold on and anchor your soul to the fact that God has given a hope that transcends every trial that you face? Our hope is secure because Christ's victory over death is final. That his victory over sin is final. You will still mess up, but you are covered under his feet. For those who run and are anchored in Christ himself. So first thing, if you're taking notes, this hope that I want for you today, this hope that I'm praying that you anchor your soul in, it is a hope rooted in Christ's resurrection. The first place that we're going to have to return to is to the cross. I don't know what you believe and how you've allowed, you know, the word of God to either build you or some of us, we've allowed it to get dull in our lives. But when we talk about Christ's resurrection, it's not for you to answer loudly, but ask yourself, take inventory today. When you think about the cross and what Christ did, does that fill you with hope? Does it, does it truly fill you with hope? 
Or is your hope, just like the Bible warns, has your hope migrated to other things in this world? Come on. Let's be honest this morning. Some of us, our hope is in that imaginary number that we're trying to get into the savings account. Like if I could get this amount, I'll be good. But if some of us are honest, we prayed that 10 years ago and he did give us the amount. And we're still running. And we're still getting on. Like we're struggling. That's a different conversation. That's a, a conversation on budget and how you steward. But you all catch the point. The power of the cross, the power of the resurrection has been replaced by our hope being put in other things. You're hoping for that next move, that next job, that next promotion, that next relationship. I love it. Yeah, everybody welcome here. But sometimes I just wonder if we need a fine print to this no perfect people. <laughs> but it's true, right? It's true. That's why he could that's why he could shout out that way. Because some of you staying quiet, but you your heart running towards your relationship. You're anchored in the hope of a life that you believe you deserve. So let me ask the hard question. What if God does not meet any more prayers? If he doesn't answer any more prayers in your life, is what he has what he did on the cross is it enough? And that is the question we have to wrestle with right now. I could tell you about our hope in Christ, but some of you need to dethrone some of them idols. The idol of the idea of your future self is killing your praise and your worship to God today. Your idea, your desire, your wants for the future, man, is tripping you up that you will not praise God. We singing about God's goodness. Or Sarah comes and, and brings the word. So even if you like the song or not, doesn't matter. The word was brought forward. And some of you still can't even open your mouth to pray. You all need an encounter with the Christ of the cross again. Woo. These lights here, I'm seeing all of their faces. <laughs> Production, we can't bring it back to a dark setting here. I want to paint that yellow wall black again, boy. So, <laughs> watching some of y'all. <laughs> I need hope. The human condition. So if we, we got to keep that in front of us. Not to get depressed, not to get anxious, but we need that in front of us to see ourselves the way that we're supposed to see ourselves. So this ain't the popular preacher. You're not good enough. You don't deserve all the goodness you think. We deserve God's wrath and his judgment. But because of his mercy, his goodness, his kindness, he has given us salvation. Some of us need to come off of our high way of thinking of ourselves. But why God didn't do this? Why God didn't do that? Hey, why God didn't judge? But he slow his anger, but rich his mercy. Lest we start to see ourselves the right way. We have lost truly the weight of this hope that we have. Matthew 28, 6 says, He's not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. And I love this verse. I know it sounds real, up, like just abstract. But you know, for some of you, when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, this is not blind faith. This is from witnesses, eyewitnesses, who historically, that whether the Christians as well as the secular, they... The way that they say this, the secular historians and professors, and so they say this. They say, we believe that people believe that they saw a risen 
Christ has been because of the many testimonies. So they don't want to believe it yet, but they, they can acknowledge that something happened that people believed that Christ was once dead, but he's risen again. And because of that, you have a hope that should transcend everything that you face. And if you truly understand the condition of our own hearts, that there should be a level of gratitude, thanksgiving, and joy that secures you no matter what you face. And listen to me, I'm preaching this message as someone who has failed badly in, in seasons here. There are times I'm willing to tell you that I did not hold on to the rock or any, I didn't have no hope. But I'm grateful to our God who loves us. Who calls us back out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Amen. I gave you a lot of scriptures there. Here are some things that can build your, your hope for this week. Is your homework. A hope rooted in faith in the divine salvation in Christ. Galatians 5, 5. Um, it says, for we through the spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Amen. And that's divinity. Because we know none of us are righteous. So our hope is in because of what Christ did, we will be made righteous. So we're waiting on that. And it's not a hope like when you talk about, hey, well, I hope it rained today. Well, I, I hope the church are a little cooler this Sunday. It's not hope and a wishful thinking. It's a hope rooted with deep expectation. That I hope on Christ to be, to be made righteous in his sight. Because he already did what is necessary. So your hope is rooted in a faith, in that divine salvation. You have a hope. Brought in by the presence of the promised Holy Spirit. It says, for in Romans 8, 24 to 25, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope for. Who hopes for what he already sees? Our hope is in the Holy Spirit that we can't see. It says, but if we hope for what we do not see, through perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Man, there is something about the Holy Spirit that we need to reconnect to. You know, we talk about Jesus walking the earth. But Jesus said, I leave and I send the Holy Spirit to you. Remember, I challenged you weeks ago. That we should be living as Christians like if Jesus is still on this earth. Because he is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there with us and that when you sit here, when you, wherever you go, that the Holy Spirit goes with you. How should that change how we act? How should that change how we speak and how we behave? Because he is with us. There is a hope in the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. You know when Paul was writing this, we who have seen God throughout the ages from the time this was written to now, we know that the Holy Spirit works. You can testify about that, not just in history of the church, but in the history of your life. That you, uh, that you, you, you know how we say it? I was going to do this, but I just followed my mind. No. The Holy Spirit speaking, protecting you. You've seen where little decisions that wasn't in yourself, that God moved in your life, preserved you, blessed you, protected you. But there's a hope in that. There's a future hope of the resurrection of the dead. You know, Paul says it um, in Acts. It's recorded there. He says, I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. There are many of us that will face the trials of this world and the critique and the opposition. It's not in flesh and blood. But it's in opposition to the hope that we should have. That there's a resurrection of our new body that's coming. That though we are, we are withering away every day, we are growing stronger from within. There's a hope in that. I wonder if you still have that. The return of Christ, obviously, is a hope to, to rest in. Hope in redemption of us. 
and the whole creation. I made a mistake there. It's Romans 8, 22, not verse 23. It says, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. That even creation itself is yearning for the return of God. And I want you. What is the hope that you're holding on to? That Christ would do something, that God would do something in your life to give you that promotion, to give you that relationship. Like, just imagine how weak our hope is. Because if we are honest, we get the things that we hope for, and it soon loses its power. It soon is not good enough. It soon enough is not satisfying. Come on. I've been there. We put our hope in, in that next step or in that, in that next move or whatever it is in your life. And when you achieve it, it's good for a while. It energizes you. It gives you hope. But it's soon lost. It's soon lost. And our hope in redemption, just like with the whole of creation. That, you, know, you know, I love the scripture when it says, even the rocks would cry out. Why? Because even creation is subject to the authority, power, and majesty of our king. This one is for free. If I believe in creation yearning for God's return, that's why I don't believe the earth will be destroyed by climate change. Woo! Because the Bible says otherwise. Yeah, let, 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 let hit this one time. Because that becomes its own religious belief, and you don't see this. You hold on to worldviews that contradict the word that you say believe is the word of God. You act and live around those views more than the scripture. I know that's why our kids being indoctrinated and we losing that fight because we won't have these types of conversations. So I'll say it and some of you will get vexed, but you won't come back to say, well, let's have a discussion. You know, now nah, pastor, you know what he's talking about, blah, blah. Y'all miss me with that. We are under attack with the worldview of the scripture against what this world is telling you. And we're losing our young people because we're not willing to engage in those conversations. See, I probably have a little more fire because my daughter is being in the service now. So I want to deal with those things. But when she goes out there, she's going to be hearing all our garbage. I'm not saying steward the, the earth. We should. But don't treat it that like that's the main thing. So you're, you're promoting climate change needs to be changed. But we ain't talking about all the children being slaughtered in abortion. Oh, our heart's wicked, you know. Our heart's wicked. All right, all right, hope, hope, hope. Hope and transformation into the likeness of Christ. Look how good that one come in. First John 3, 2 to 3. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope set on him, listen to this, purifies himself just as he is pure. That's the problem with the gospel right now. How much are we changing to become like him right now? We hold on to the hope of his return, but are we truly being transformed into his holiness? That should be a hope for us. Romans 15, 13, this one is in your, in your guide. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy, peace, believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I challenge our, our team this morning, telling them about the message. I said, we've lost the, you know, I'm talking about the cross. We, we forget that God didn't just die for our sins, but he died to reclaim our joy, to regain our peace. And some of us are living right now in a space where we're more worried and anxious about tomorrow. We're anxious about what we don't know, 
not trusting in the one who already broke every stronghold, who broke every chain in your life. Yeah, that addiction, you can't even see yourself breaking. He's already in that space. But I wonder if you're willing to run back to him. If you're willing to center your life around the hope of the cross. I kept telling my team, and they wanted me to sing it, but all you already deal with heat, we don't want all you deal with anything else. But that song, Because He Lives, I can face tomorrow. That's been in my heart for the entire week, just singing. Because we've lost that. We look at tomorrow with more fear and more anxiety, even though we say we serve the God of who's already in tomorrow. We quote his promises when we're on the high, when we're on the mountaintop. But when we go into the valley, we forget all of it about it. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. When was the last time you really lived like that? That in your life right now, you're in a valley that you don't know how tomorrow is going to take care of itself. Some of you, you don't have that job. You don't have that income. You don't have those relationships. You don't have the pieces all put together. And all you live in is our fear. Come on. That hope has to come back. All that fear has to go. I'm believing for you today that you will anchor your life in hope that is not in this world. Hope is here. His name is Jesus. Amen. And I'm calling our community and every single one of you online back to our hope that is in the cross of Jesus Christ. A hope that says, hey, I don't have all the answers, but I'll trust the one who I've put my faith in. That even if it doesn't work out the way that I want, or the way that I believe I deserve sometimes, I'm not letting go. Charles Spurgeon says, we have a sure hope because we have a sure Savior. Come on, church. Be reminded. Be reminded that this hope is still here for you. Come on, run back to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen? Time to get your fight back. Time to get your fight back. If you're taking notes, number two, hope to persevere through the trial. And God wants to give us a hope to persevere through the trial. Trials produce perseverance, which leads to character and then leads to hope. If you've not been dealing with your trials well, then I know we definitely don't have that hope in this space. James 1, chapter 1, verse 2 to 4 says, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Come on, say that. It produces what? And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Your trials aren't here to make you just run back and ask God to help you. Your trials should be producing mature Christianity on this earth right now. That if it is that we truly have a hope that is in Christ, when we face these trials and we face these testings, guess what? We're supposed to look different from the world. We're supposed to be looking at our trials, not as the enemy hitting us hard, but that God is doing something in us. Y'all, I have no mercy or no grace for the devil, but some of y'all is real with him unfairly. Some of the trials you face is because of the seeds you sowed. And it's just called consequences. But you masking a spiritual attack. If you go with the wrong person, what do you expect? (laughs) 
We don't promote licks in this house, boy. What's wrong? <laughs> but that's what you'll get. Some of you, 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 you going through trials because you make the wrong choices. But God gives you the grace still to endure. So it's time you shift how you looked at your trials. Let me say this as lovingly as I can say it. It's not about you. It's time to take ourselves out of these places like we're so important. It ain't even about what you could do for the kingdom. It's about him and his glory. And guess what? News to you. Whether you obey or not, he's going to have his will done. We just have the opportunity and the privilege and the honor to say, yes, God, use me. We all need to get off this arrogant way of thinking. It ain't about you. So the way that we view our trials has to change. The way we view what we've been through in the past has to change. Or do you really believe that God is able to turn everything around for his glory? Even the mistakes we made. We ain't talking about what came against us that we had no control over. But some of us have so much of pride that we will not even receive the grace of God. Got to get back to the cross. But there's a hope that he's calling all of us to. It's a maturity that we learn to face our trials and persevere through it. That we say, hey, and I'm telling you, you, you will get knocked down at times. You will get knocked down. But what are you doing still being down? Why are you still on the ground? Why are you still talking about what they did five years ago? Why are you still talking about what should have been, could have been? And you got breath in your lungs today. Why aren't you doing what God has called you to? It's time we treated our trials very differently. Because here's why we rooted in a hope. That is so different. We are rooted in our hope that when the storms come, listen, you know what I want to tell you today? It's a maturity God is using this dark season in your life to bring you out refined. He is burning away the dirt and the filth the devil attached to you through the years. And instead of fighting it, go through it. The Jesus that we serve, that we believe and put our faith in, is the same one who still controls the wind and the wave. And some of you are in a storm right now, you're in a trial, and you, listen, you allow that to knock the wind out of you. And you, you tuck your tail between your legs and you're just holding on to survive. When God calling you, that the hope that is ahead, I press on. I press on to the higher calling. That Listen, I'm going through the storms, beating my face, but I know who's with me in the storm. I know he still has, by a word, he could make that storm die. He just wants to see if I trust him. He just wants to see if my hope's still in him or it, it, it anchored in something else. That's why he removed so much of your, of your crutch that you had in your life. The things that you've put before him, you think is the enemy taking it? No. Is God trying to get your heart fully? Some of you still playing this one foot in, one foot out. And I ask you again, if he does not answer any more prayers, has he done enough already? In taking the scales from your eyes to see that he is king of kings. That he went to the cross and he paid for your sin and for mine. Is that still valuable in the church today? A crowd here. Bro. Romans 5 verse 3 to 5. And hope is here. Not only in this, but we also celebrate in tribulation. Not just our joy, you know. But it's time you should be celebrating. 
I, I don't want to say this too loud, eh, because I I still need some blessings in this one. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Come on, come on. Some of you gotta persevere in this time. And perseverance, what does it produce? Proven. Come on, some what 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 building in us? So when you endure through the trials, with your heart rooted on the hope that you have in Christ, what producing? Character. So, so if, I, if we look at and we say some of them church people is the worst people, maybe we can look back and see how we've taught a weak gospel that we run from trials rather than embrace it then. Because we, we love all the, the cotton candy gospels that tell us that God is for you and he wants your happiness and he's there for you. Yo, it's time to understand. He saved us. That's more than enough. That's more than enough. Because if you think about the truth of the gospel and the truth of the, what the word says, what's coming after is far greater for those who believe, but far worse than what we experience in here. So we preach a weak gospel, and I'm saying to you that it's time you embrace those trials, and you don't just go through them with a joy, but you start celebrating. So it, it changes the way you speak. So we stop talking and complaining and murmuring about how much we've been praying for X, Y, or Z, and we start thanking God. If our belief in Christ is anchored on our own gains, then we will not endure the trial. If your hope is in something you have achieved or that you're running after or some career, some title, some relationship, some material, that house, a car, whatever it is. If your hope is anchored on the things in your hands, you will not survive the trial. How many of us, man, myself included, come face to face with those choices where God, I ain't sure I want this again. Come on, we could we'll be honest here. You've ever been there? But because of his mercy and his grace, we're still here. But he's calling us now to a stronger walk. I said he's calling us to a stronger walk. A more mature walk in his faith. It ain't a Sunday morning Christianity that God is trying to build here. John Calvin says the storms of life will come, but they cannot prevail against a hope that is anchored in Christ. Come on, it's time to get your hope back. It's time to get your fight back. It's time for you to face the storm in your life. And make up your mind from now, from today, I'm not turning back. I'm not turning back. Come hell or high water, I don't care what you put in front of me, I know who's the king of the storm still. And I believe in his promise that there are times and seasons I'll go through the fires, but I'll come out purified. That even in the worst and the darkest days, he's doing something good in me. For his glory. For his honor. Hope is here, church. His name is Jesus. Are you starting to believe again? I'm praying, man. My, my, my prayer. And getting up this morning early. Praying for you guys. That you would start to hope again. You'd start to dream. Daydream about what good God has for you. That's hard to say that because some only thinking about that relationship. I am talking about daydreaming rather than worrying and being anxious about the economy. What Trump going and do now? I'm sorry, I had to just stick that one in there. 
But and that's how we live. Worrying about everything that we have no control over. But the king is still on his throne. He said, why do the nations rage? The king is still on the throne. That man can do what they want, but they will bow to his will. So why are you fearful that if we see hardship, that he still blesses in the famine? Have you not read your word? That he preserves his people? That the remnant remains strong and burn brightest in the darkest of days? That we influence and affect nations in, in times and seasons? That God is looking for people who will stand firm in their faith and say no matter what comes, we will not be moved and we will not be shaken. A legacy of hope is what we are called to. We should live differently. And why? Because this is my call and my challenge. If you make that decision, if you return to the cross, if you, if, if you break your own heart from the things that you have worshipped and put it back onto Jesus Christ, that you are called, number three, you are to encourage others with hope. Just think about today. What happens if we all come into this space so anchored on hope that when you hear that brother or that sister's challenge or storm that's right next to you, you empathize with them, you love them, but then you look at them and say, hey, God's been faithful before, he's going to be faithful again. But you can't even do that right now. You know why? You don't even have that hope. It's time, man. God's calling us back. Hope City, it's a legacy of hope that we live in here. It's a legacy of hope he's called us to. We sell our God way too short. It's time. It's time to represent him the way he's called us to. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Therefore encourage one another and build one another up, just as you also are doing. Bless God for those who I know in this community who do that so well. Who love and serve one another. Come on, but it's, that's not a call for a few. Buying a spiritual gift, that's a command and an instruction by God for all of us. To encourage one another, to love, to build up one another. You know what building up looks like sometimes? You know, in construction, when you have a building that's up, sometimes that. You can't, you have to tear it down before you put up what you want. You all with me? Because you have to do work on the foundation. Sometimes building up one another, it feels like tearing down. But God is calling us to a place of maturity where we can love each other, not just with grace and with love, but with truth as well. And so the way that we build up one another is not just what you can do for someone, you know. But let me ask it this way. Can someone speak into your dark area? Can someone come and speak into the places you don't look too much like you like? That way you acted on the job? My brother, my sister. That's not who Christ called us to. See, we read that building up one another. And it's good. You should take ownership of what you can say and give. And the way you can love and serve someone else. But the truth is, are we ready to receive that? Are we ready to receive from that person next to you? From that family or that friend? That, hey. You're missing the mark here. It's a hope that we have for each other. To see God's call, to see God's plan and his purpose fulfilled. Hebrews 10, 23, 25. Let's hold firmly, come on, to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful.
Let's consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds. Not abandoning our own meeting together, as is the habit of some people, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. I'm just talking about the, the return of Christ. As you see that day coming, with all the trials, with all the storms, he says, don't stop meeting together, but don't stop encouraging each other. Don't stop holding on to the faith that you profess, that is in the hope. That hope is Jesus Christ. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Some of you think your best day is gone. I want to speak to the the wealthy in experience here. If I say old folks, elderly as get bash. So those who are wealthy in experience, because <laughs> I didn't want to get, I get real buff up, you know, Lord. Some of you act like your best day is gone. I told in the wedding yesterday, there was an elderly couple, the grandparents to the, to the bride. And I told them, I said, you know, you all need to, you all need to teach them. You know, her grand, their granddaughter getting married yesterday. So you ought to teach them, you ought to encourage them. And, they, and you know, they kind of pull back. I was like, I said, what happened to you all? We need your wisdom. We need your experience. You ought to help us not make the same mistakes. You ought to help us go a little bit further because we learn from you. And some of you, you've lost your hope. Listen, as long as you can breathe right now, as long as you've got breath in you, God's not done with you. And he's got so much more for you. That you are called to do more for God in this time. And some of you act and live like your best year is gone. Some of you young right now. I still young. Okay, all well, the way I see it, I read in scripture, Caleb, when he was 80 years old, told Joshua, let me take the mountain. And he was full of strength and warring still. So I know reach the first half of my life. A little bit over. As far as I'm concerned, I had half my life to learn what not to do and how not to live. I'm now ready to get started. Last person I said that to was my older brother. But when he when he died at 43, I had lost that. I never said it in the first time saying it I said. He's doing something in my life to hope again. To believe again. Some of you afraid of hope. You're afraid of how the situation will go. Listen, if he gives me one day again, whether he gives me one year, ten years, God, I want to go out holding on to that hope that you are still good, you are still king, you are still master of my life, and with every breath, I will give you praise, I will give you thanks, and I'll shout and declare that Jesus Christ is King of all kings. He's Lord of all lords. And let them know that when my time comes, they'll at least say, He never gave up on His King. He never gave up on the one who saved His soul, who took His sins on the cross and gave him mercy and grace when he deserved wrath and judgment. Ooh, it's time to hope again. It's time to dream again. It's time to take that bread that God has gifted you with and say, God, with this bread, I give you everything. 
I give you my all. I give you my strength. I give you my energy. I give you my will. Because hope is here. And his name is Jesus. Because he lives. Come, don't make me sing it here. Come on, let, let's let's do it. One, do all it all. All it all leave me like a fool up here. <laughs> Come on. I don't want no cheats. Cheats here. Come on. If you believe that today. Come on. I can face tomorrow. Come on. Let your hope come back. Come on, if you believe that, sing that. Who holds your future? Come on, are you joyful again? Because he lives, come on. Those who believe, lift your hand, stand to your feet. Fill this place with an authentic praise. Your days ain't done yet. Hey, your purpose is erased. Come on, come on from deep within. Come on, do you really know? Shout it from the top of your lungs. This is your declaration. Come on, give him some praise. Take back what the enemy stole. Take back your future. Take back your joy. Take back your strength. Let a praise come from within that says no matter what comes, I will not be moved. He's in my future. He's in my today. I know who holds it. A.W. Toza says, a Christian should be the most hopeful person in the world for his future is as bright as the promises of God. He said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. I cannot promise you that your days are going to be good. I wish I could rewrite so much of my life. I still struggle to put under the blood fear, anger, bitterness. And it always reminds me but I'm running to the cross. If there's one way I want you to follow me, follow me to the cross. Not for anything I do here. Not for this church. 
not for no organization, not for nothing in my life. If there's only, there's only one thing worthy of following me for, follow me as I run back to the cross every single day because he lives. The cross is my victory. It is my hope. Hope City, it's yours today. It's time to go back to Christ. Hope is here. And his name, his name is, his name.